this is our day. In this episode, we boldly go where everybody has gone before and check out the next generation of gaming hardware. Okay, she's gone! Fran plays shadow games as she takes a look at indie puzzle platformer Contrast. Now we go this way. Follow me! And I see if there's life in the old dog yet as I lock and load for Call of Duty Ghosts. Hello and welcome to the Killer Bits, where we're going to be talking about the next generation of console gaming. We're here at Game in St. Orsel, where we are at a PS4 lock-in event. It's super exciting. I'm going to find out if I've made a huge mistake by pre-ordering an Xbox One. Let's roll that footage. So we've got a PS4 pad and it's like our first impressions and the first thing that I'm noticing as a human being is that if I strafe right and look left, my thumbs touch. That is like kissing thumbs is like- You have like monster thumbs. I know I have monster thumbs. I mean, come on Fran, you've got tiny hands. Let's see if you're right. like- Okay, fine. So, it, so already <laughs> it's alienating the mainstream. <laughs> it looks like a Pixar cartoon. So I'm here with Georgia, who's had a look at the PlayStation 4. Georgia, what are your first impressions? I absolutely love it so far. Love the new controllers. Like really, really good feel. Uh, played Knack. Absolutely brilliant game. A lot more difficult than what I thought it would be, but really, really enjoying it. Really and have you got one uh, pre-ordered already? Yeah, I got Knack and Battlefield 4 pre-ordered already, so it should be good. I had a little play around, had a little order today. And have you had a look at the Xbox One at all, or are you just purely a PlayStation 4 girl? I have, I'm predominantly PlayStation. I have looked at the Xbox One, but I obviously I'm very biased towards the PlayStation. I've always been more into that. So. I'm here with Andy. He's just had a good go on the uh, the PS4. So, what were your first impressions? Uh, I'm impressed with the controller. That's probably the one thing that I've come away with from today. Um, I've recently switched to PlayStation. I've always been an Xbox 360 guy. Uh, recently bought a PS3 controller, but the controller is is really really good. Hey, so I'm here with Hayden, who's also had a look at the PlayStation 4. Hayden, what did you like about it? I um, absolutely love the share button of it and the social features. Can't wait to uh, stream all my games and get all that out there. Um, I love Knack. I'm really uh, reminiscent of Crash and Spire and stuff like that, so that's really cool. Um, I can't wait to get my hands on kills, I know. That's the main game that I'm going to be getting my hands on. Yeah, it seems everyone's got a lot of excitement uh, down for Killzone. Have you pre-ordered Killzone and also a PlayStation 4? Yeah, I've got my PS4 pre-ordered every game other than FIFA pre-ordered so that'll be really good. We've got about 34 games on day one so that'll be hell for playing. So we've all had a good chance to play with the PS4. I, mean, I really like the pad. It felt a little bit smaller um, but I didn't think it didn't think it didn't work. It, it felt like a child's play thing. I'm not gonna lie. You have shovel hands Toby. Um, I played uh, Super Motherload which reminded me of a two-year-old flash game with a bit of spit and polish. It was enjoyable but I'm not sure we're quite next generation gaming just yet. What did so, you play? So what, oh wait, well I played Knack, which was definitely next generation. Like it looks like a Pixar cartoon, but I had to navigate it with a pad that was way too small for my gigantic hands. Fran, what have you been? Well, I had the option to play FIFA 14 and then decided I would probably rather beat myself to, the de to death with the PlayStation 4 than play FIFA. So I played Octodad, which was hilarious. And I also checked out uh, Contrast, which is available on Xbox. PS4 and I've been playing it on PC. Ladies and gentlemen, in this world of shadows, what seems familiar may be dangerous. You would never lie to me, would you? With the games industry on the ever up, indie games are emerging as some of the most affordable and best games out there. Compulsion Games hopes to make a name for itself with its debut title, Contrast. Set in the 1920s, you play as Dawn, the seemingly imaginary friend to a small child, Dee Dee. As is the current trend in the industry, Dee Dee plays the role of your young female companion and guide throughout the game. Come on, we'll miss our show! Using Dawn's ability to become her own shadow, gameplay consists of a series of 2 and 3D puzzling and platforming. The controls are simple and fluid. 
at least using a keyboard and mouse. The only real control issue I encountered was when I succeeded in implanting myself within a wall. Considering this is a debut title, I can forgive one bug. The concept is well executed, solving each challenge by shifting between the real and shadow world seamlessly and arranging props in order to access new areas. New abilities are acquired throughout the entire game, which runs at about three hours in length. Thus, gameplay is restricted from becoming stale, as new and interesting ways to solve each puzzle are presented, from dashing through shadows to transposing real-world elements into the shadow realm. The only real downside I found to the gameplay was that, as is the case with many platformers these days, there was no penalty for dying. Instead, you simply respawn and try again. This negated some of the challenge of the actual gameplay, and meant that the game is more of a mental challenge. Graphically, the game is aesthetically pleasing. Steering clear of the retro pixel approach many other developers are progressively beating to death, Compulsion Games captures a stereotypical 1920s city after hours in an iconic way. Cabaret, music, gangsters, voice acting, all of it mixes together like the perfect recipe for the setting they wanted to achieve. The minute details they include, such as the decor on the walls, it all adds to the mood the developers wanted to create in order to tell a story, and they have succeeded on every level. Combining shadow shows with innocuous collectibles, Contrast's main story is narrated via short and snappy cutscenes. Are you coming home? <laughs> That's my plan. But to appreciate and fully comprehend the plot, the player must obtain collectibles throughout the game to piece together the complete nature of the story. The initial introduction of Didi led me to believe the plotline would be simple and innocent. However, it is anything but. I really wish you had been at my birthday. The first act is abounding with intrigue and betrayal, hooking you into the game as the story unfurls. Unfortunately, I would say it's also the best third of the game. Whilst the following two acts are in no way poor, they seem to branch off on a tangent from the initial setup in order to create a more interesting gameplay for the protagonist. The story seems to tail off and fizzle out as opposed to building into a crescendo. Thus, by the end of the credits, I was left feeling that the story was a little lacking, that something was missing to leave me completely satisfied. Are you okay up there? You need any help? Here, jump on this! Despite the loss of direction in the plot, the setting and gameplay really shine through to make this an impressive debut. It's definitely worth a look. I would give Contrast a solid 6 out of 8. I think it's time for Compulsion Games to step out of the shadows. So that was Contrast, and although it's free on a PlayStation Store, uh, it's not free on Steam. But fortunately for you guys at home, we have three copies to give away later on. Would you really say it's fortunate for them? Yeah, they get a free game, and it's a good game as well. Okay, fair. Right, before this blows up, um, PlayStation 4. Obviously, it's been, <laughs> it's, it's been out in America for a little while. Mm. They've had some small issues, uh, and obviously the, the Xbox One's out over here about a week ago, because I, we're living in the past. I don't know particularly whether or not I would call them small issues on the PS4. I mean, we've got dodgy HDMI ports, the flashing blue death pulse. <laughs> I mean, we did try to talk to a Sony rep at that thing that we went to, yeah. but they were unresponsive. Is that uncooperative? Uncooperative. Unco Evasive. I was gonna, sort of, I'm just following orders. Yeah. I'm not going to say that we need a Nuremberg trial to deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> but on the browser, it's only, what, 0.4% of, of defective copies are expected? Yeah, and they've hit a million mark, so what's 0.4 of a million? Well, Way too many. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine if this had happened on the Atari 2600. Yeah, we're well, sorry, there'll be a day one patch. It doesn't have the internet. Brilliant, I can't play Pong. I can't fucking You do deal. get to play your 165 minutes of patching to play games. Oh my god, it's my favourite game. I love watching bars. <laughs> or as I call it, XCOM. Guys, guys, calm down okay. about next gen. This and gen. let's focus on saying goodbye to this gen. So come on, what was good, what was bad, what was ugly? <laughs> Everything was ugly, let's not lie to ourselves. Like, since 2005, graphics have come a long way, except in consoles. I feel terrible for not having a PC. Yeah, but you've only just recently discovered what a HDMI port's for, so they look significantly better with the... Yeah. <laughs> that unboxing video. Yeah, it's USB. That's, that's what I think they look like. <laughs> I don't I, fucking know shit. I disagree with you on the whole graphical issue. I think some console games look lovely. Like when I first played Gears of War 3. My, me and my TV, we some were like, we were, we bonded. Okay, so what was your highlights of the generation? Purely for the fact that it didn't destroy like one of my favourite childhood games. Um, Deus Ex Human Revolution 
Um, I thought it, it managed to keep the spirit of the franchise alive, which kind of links me to my low point, which is the fact that Diablo 3 ruined my favourite franchise of all time. I would argue with you that as a PC game, Diablo 3 doesn't count. Or should yeah, I just go over there and get my PS3 copy and wave it at you and say it definitely counts as this Wait, generation? Wait, you, you bought a PS3 copy <laughs> after experiencing the delights on PC? Only for the bar. Do you just like have more money than sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. opened the bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for me, um, low lights. I, I just pretend like it never happened, even though it's currently sitting in my games collection. Sonic the Hedgehog 2006. Oh, <laughs> that's not even a game, though. But it was a game. No, I could say like tech demos were the low point of my of my generation. Didn't you complete? Yes, all three storylines. But what did you enjoy about the generation? Oh, something that was like a real kind of curveball that you you just kind of. You end, I ended up playing and then was like, I love this game so very, very much. Even though it has its, its flaws. Viva Piñata. Have you played that? Yeah, it was a launch title. And it was And you're saying that in the last good. eight years, there has been nothing no, better. No, that's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying Sorry, that if, that if that's was, her like, argument, Diablo 3 is still in. Yeah. No, 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 shush. <laughs> what this game actually is, is some kind of like garden game where you have like a snake piñata that yeah. eats the rabbit piñata, so it kills the rabbit piñata and then consumes the, the candy contents. I understand. You have a shovel you can beat to death evil piñatas with. Like, oh my god. Fran, I understand that as like a zoologist or whatever it is that you actually want to do with your life when you're not doing this, it must be a fascinating ecosystem simulator. It's amazing. But it is a game about piñatas. And then there was Spore, which was shit. Like, yeah. Viva Piñata is amazing, Spore is terrible. Oh, maybe that's because one was made by Rareware and one was made by EA. Do you not, do you not like Viva Piñata? I, no, I think that Viva Piñata is a fine game. I just I wouldn't put it up there with, like, Dark Souls or Mario Galaxy. I'm getting into my highlights now. <laughs> that, was, gonna... that, was, that was well... Yeah, see, that, that was gleam. That was a segue, masterful. Uh, I mean, Uncharted 2 as well. I think that Dark Souls, Mario Galaxy, and Uncharted 2 are probably the three things that I've actually enjoyed the most about this generation. And Uncharted 1 and 3 were just... Garbage. Do we have 20 minutes for you to list your least favourite games? Uh, no, we don't. But Bionic Commando Rearm 2, I'd say, was probably the lowest point of this generation because, one, they took Rad Spencer, an amazing character, gave him a stupid moustache and, like, made him just really unfunny. <laughs> I mean, I even liked Bionic Commando 2010. Like, that, that's how dedicated I am to that. And I mean, Bionic Commando started out as a game where you killed Hitler with a rocket launcher. They couldn't have missed the mark any further. <laughs> I mean, all in all, what do you guys think? Successful generation? I love this generation so much. Like, I haven't really dabbled in PlayStation other than Little Big Planet, which is amazing. Oh shit, Little Big Planet, that's another highlight. That's yeah. actually amazing. No, ab actually absolutely, amazing. yeah. Okay. I can't believe um, we uh, we glossed that one like, over. We, we wise, there was so much good stuff. There was Donkey Kong Country Returns, which is mm. a fantastic game. It's like a really difficult platformer, and I like difficult, because then you just, Says the girl that was talking about Viva Pinata. Which is a also second. amazing. And then, like. Xbox. Rayman Legends on the Wii U, 8 out of 8. Yeah, but. but is that this generation? generation? I mean, obviously, I would, it's on this generation's technology. I would. But is it this generation? Um, I don't know. If we include it in this generation, definitely. If we have to, like, stick to the 360, the PS3 versions, that's going right on the bottom of the yeah, list. That was that's a, going in massive that was disappointment. A fucking cancer. Your potential. I'm not, I'm not sure how we're going to go from this one. Okay. I, I think I think we should just I think we should just go onto a review and leave I, this where it is. No, or maybe we, we should ask, ask the audience, since that's because... your job. Uh, you know, I was I was kind of hoping we could just gloss. No, no obviously, we can't. obviously, Toby. So, you guys, what is your high and low points of the generation? What did you really enjoy? What are you going to get all vitriolic and Toby-like about? I mean, we we're really keen to hear it so that we can tell you how right or wrong you are. I look forward to that. truly loves his country doesn't just give his life he gives his sons Twenty thirteen has been a pretty good year for gaming. I mean, we've had a couple of AAA hits, uh, some indie smashes, and even some weird things out of left field that have really redefined the way that we looked at games. Activision's latest modern military shooter, however, really does prove that sometimes an audience needs to have been lobotomized for a game to be enjoyed. Holy shit! 
Call of Duty Ghosts might actually be the worst Call of Duty game. There, I said it. Review done. It's a travesty, a Teflon abortion whose utter blandness and crushing mediocrity serve only to underline that the so-called mainstream of gaming is deader than Napoleon. I legitimately wish that I had never played this game. Let's start with the story, if you can call it that. Infinity Ward's side of the Call of Duty games have always been the ones more rooted in plausibility than their counterparts over at Treyarch's installments. Modern Warfare, for example, was less out there than the Black Ops games. This game takes that ideal and pisses it firmly up the wall, opting for a frankly insulting spectacle rather than any engaging plot elements, characters or settings. The game starts out with a grim monologue chronicling the rise of a new supranational authority in the form of the Federation, who've taken over South America. Why South America? Well, because unless you know literally anything about geopolitics, it's the closest and spookiest place from which the USA could be traditionally attacked. Needless to say, this attack happens while you, your brother, and your father, all muscular, wealthy white men, are sitting around talking about a mysterious super soldier force called the Ghosts. Ooh, I wonder what could make this any more predictable, I hear you ask. Well, how about an orbital bombardment of the entire US, made ironic by the fact that the Feds are using an American super weapon? This leads to the first moment of the game that actually had me yelling at my scream due to the insulting stupidity present in the game's writing. First off, if you get shot in a spacesuit, the spacesuit may as well be made of tissue paper and hope. Because now it's just a coffin. Secondly, you're using conventional firearms in space, something which could literally never work. It's also the first moment where you get a Call of Duty trademark heroic death, or as I call it, Patreo wanking. Little writing tip for you guys over at Infinity Ward, I have to have known a character for more than maybe a minute and a half before I give a shit whether or not they live or die. From there, the world, or the US at least, is completely fucked. We rejoin the war ten years down the line, when the Americans are fighting and it's a losing battle on home soil. It's there that we're introduced to the worst mechanic in any game ever made. Your fucking battle dog. Riley, or worst idea in gaming, is a valued member of your squad. <laughs> then again, your squad consists of you, your brother Hesh, and the dog. Grab gear, let's move. Of the three, it's the dog who receives the most points for humanity, since apparently everyone else is a cardboard machine designed to dispense woeful, intensely hypocritical statements about the state of the war, and according to Infinity Ward, this is what their audience fucking deserve. It wasn't until I realised that Hesh was saying things like, We'll leave our dog with you, or the screen said, And I shit you not, press left bumper to use dog attack, that I realised that the idea was one designed to make the developers happy and not the players. Blah blah blah, plot moves on, and you become, and spoiler alert here, a Call of Duty ghost, because holy shit, your dad was the dude in the story he was talking about at the start! And the game becomes more expendables than Platoon, and we can all turn it off because it has nothing more to offer. My biggest criticism of the plot, though, isn't the vitriolic narrative on the state of modern globalism, or that every character is named Merrick or Rock and communicate only by spitting gravel, it's that there is literally no reason for any of it to be happening. There's a level set in Caracas, a city you decimate in a flashback to explain why the Call of Duty ghosts are such badasses, which made me actually want to be sick. The level was actually one of the coolest in the game, starting with a zipline into a building and ending with that building exploding. But what got me was that the city of Caracas actually looked really fucking nice. Remind me again why the USA, a husk of a country covered in the craters from all the fucking tungsten rain, wouldn't just submit or at least cooperate with a power whose democracy and ideology was identical to its own, and whose cities were nicer, cleaner, and more free than those of the US ever were. Oh yeah, patrio wanking. I forgot that it's not possible for a country who, in this world at least, built a satellite to bomb other countries from orbit and can't even provide public health care without being accused of communism to be anything but the good guys. Sorry, Infinity Ward. Guess I'm just not on the same page as you guys. Graphically, the game's a tour de shit. The textures are downright fucking embarrassing. The character models look like empty shells with bad faces shopped onto them, and the dog, a oh, bless his little cotton socks, made me want to open my wrists. Correct me if I'm wrong, the second that I can actually pick out the individual pixels used in a lighting mask, the game's graphics can only be described as turgid, right? So, I've covered the campaign and the way the game looks, but what else is there to really say about Call of Dogs? 
Well, the sound design isn't brilliant, all of the music's shit, and because it's a Call of Duty game, all of the guns sound like bubble wrap being popped in a faraway room. Why do people even buy these games? Oh yeah, the, the multiplayer. Meh. That's all that can really be said. Like seeing more dog models being forced down your throat? There's a kill streak for that. Enjoy getting called a faggot by 13-year-olds who live in frankly ridiculous places? Don't sweat it. Kadogs has you covered. There's a plethora of modes to choose from. A nice array of unlockable skins for your character and boomsticks for your floaty arms. But it's not anything that you've not seen every year prior. Which is a shame. There's quite a nice little zombie... I mean, extinction mode, which is totally new, and nothing like zombies, which is cool as a novelty, but really boring in practice. You have to protect a drill from some aliens as you get the nuke to the rally point, or some shit, but the levels are way too long, and the unlocks are way too boring to merit any kind of special mention. Aliens also, really not a good stand-in for zombies, and while the aesthetic, which is in no way reminiscent of Lost Planet in any way, is cool, it's only a distraction from shouting at those cod kiddies. So, all in, what is there to be said for Call of Duty Dog Edition? Well, if you already own a next-gen console, and you're a gigantic fucking pleb, this is the only way that you're going to be able to get your Call of Duty multiplayer experience on that shiny new metal money coffin of yours. If you're not a gigantic pleb, however, the game is heinously offensive. It's narcissistic, nationalistic, and completely pointless to boot. It's even got this weird army-branded Wii U controller that I kept noticing popping up in all of the cutscenes that kind of strips away any dignity that the console may once have had. All in all, Infinity Ward, you've become kind of a disgrace, so I'm going to give this game 2 out of 8 bits, and that's because it's a functional game, not because it's any good. What you doing, you bell end? So, clearly, Toby, you didn't like no. Call of Duty? No, I wish that I could take back those few hours of my life. But it's one of those weird kind of interim games where it appears on next gen and current, well, past gen, like oh, both generations. the transgenerational gap. Yeah, the transgenerational as, gap. As they call it. As, as you called it, just, call just then. Over and over again. What do we yeah. think about making games on both? Rick. Um, I think it's a cash cow. Really? Yeah. I just think that it's a way that publishers can compromise on quality for a finished product and then charge for it twice. How That's what I said! But oh. how are they compromising on quality? <laughs> how are they, well, okay, let's look at the graphical acuity that is possible with next gen, okay? I mean, obviously the Xbox One can't do it with full HD, but that's fine, that's beside the point. The texture memory for Call of Duty Ghosts on PC is 29.8 gigs. Or is it 28.9? Either way, you can't do that on a 360. So they're compromising on half of the product. Dragon Age Inquisition is the same way. I mean, obviously the game isn't out yet, but it means that there's going to be a good version that you have to pay through the nose for, like, and get a console. Like, like 50 quid for the disc, and then like three, four, five hundred pounds for a console to play it on. I it's a bad thing to have stuff like this, because people, generally with, with generations, it takes a couple of years for them to kind of find their stride. Mm. So this allows people who aren't upgrading yet, whether it's due to money reasons or just the launch lineup reasons or just wanting say, to wait, they can enjoy uh, some of um, the things that are coming it, out on both. There's an element of that, I think. I genuinely think that it's not a terrible idea, but I think whatever they do, they're wrong because no, they're, all, they're all just sat on their piles of money going, as far, as far as ghosts. I'm it gives them a, it's, it's also an artificially strong launch lineup. Like, okay, without Call of Duty uh, Ghosts yes, and Battlefield 4, yeah. Like being shunted onto both generations. I mean, sure, they're going to make all their money twice, but it means that they can basically release what is a last gen game and be like, don't worry about the graphics, we had to release it for 360 for the plebs. No, but that's the thing is that I don't think all publishers are doing that. Like Assassin's Creed 4 oh, on 360, God. I am having the so much fun, I can't stop spat playing. Spat on my chest. I stay oh, up I... until 5 o'clock in the morning killing whales and pillaging. Plus, what shall we do with a drunken sailor? Oh my god, they have, they have the sea morning. shanties and like you can change track. It's kind of like the GTA radio, you like pick the sea shanties. Is it just a bloke stood there with a whip? He's like, 
different song. <laughs> it's it's not a lot like that, but it is a lot like. That. And it's it's brilliant. It's like every time you climb on the ship, all of your your crew are like <laughs> captain aboard. So, uh, like the thing I, I love is less that. about how great specific games are, yeah. but more the concept of it. The I con- think is is. I- it's cons- flawed and it works at the same time. I think that the concept's great because it means that I'm going to get to enjoy like watch dogs and all kinds of stuff because I'm poor, okay? As Johnny Shit Munch, I'm perfectly happy. But if I were a games developer and like I had ethics, which I know the vast majority of them don't. Real fish! Oh, let's not talk about Phil. He cancelled Fez 2 on Twitter. Okay, <laughs> they they should be aiming for the best product possible. And if that means, like, compromising on technology, which they've been doing for the last eight years, for the last console generation, then we're going to end up with inferior games. No, because the thing is, you have to realise that if you want games, the games need to be able to make money. And if you're narrowing your market to one generation (laughs) during this interim period, then it's going to basically cause a loss of, of profit and thus you're not going to have more games in the future. How much money do you think EA and uh, Activision really need? Well, they have not hundreds of millions of pounds and they still can't release a finished product that doesn't require a day one patch. Or a good game. <laughs> let's, let's get that out there. I mean, if profits are so fucking important, why are these games so shit? I know, but not all games are shit. Why do you think, cost, audience? Yeah, not all games cost money. I mean, last uh, month we had Hearthstone to give away, which was free and yeah. will be free. I mean, you just have to buy cards. This but is a great segue. That was, a, that was fantastic. We did have a, a competition. <laughs> Holy shit. And we had a great winner as well, actually. Um, it was called Scrubsy. Scrubsy. Yeah. <laughs> if, that, if, if we're not pronouncing that right, uh, I'm sorry, but yeah. it's Scrubsy won for suggesting the, um, the Fire Emblem TCG, which I thought was such a great idea because you've got... As he pointed out, there's this or she, there's so many, um, so many characters. But what really sold it for us was the idea of a, a Fire Emblem branded paper shredder in the middle of the say, table. I would love to see like all these guys that go to Magic the Gathering, like with their hundred pound cards, just slowly lowering them into the stage. Just, like, they're just crying. For clarity's sake, the idea was that when you when your card dies, you have it's to, gone. It's gone yeah. forever. Yeah, it's not in the graveyard like in Yu-Gi-Oh. You, you like, can't it use goes, the monster. It goes anymore. in the shredder. And you as get a little bag to take it away in to feel really sad about it. As far as I'm concerned, because obviously like the whole thing's like a giant waifu simulator, we should just print them on the back of tortoises. Because tortoises live for a long time. <laughs> okay, so you could... And they're not endangered. You could have these cards for a long ass time. But no, okay. Oh no, you defeated all my hit points. Whip. Done. Dinner. Dinner. Exactly, okay. <laughs> so moving... I've solved World of Tonga and... Uh, but, to be fair, Scrubsy Scru- sold World Hunger okay. and gets a Hearthstone key for it. Well done. Scru- well done. And Fran? Yeah, from there we move on to uh, this month's competition. So as I mentioned previously, we do have three Steam keys for Contrast to give away. Mm-hmm. You just have to answer this simple question, Toby. The simple question this month is, if you could see an indie game like Contrast put across to the new generation, you know, revamped, re- whatever, which one would it be and why? No points for Fez. Or Minecraft. Well, no, because someone can say Minecraft, and if they can justify it, I'm fine with it. You know, like, maybe some physics, maybe some water, maybe some fucking storyline. Anything, anything at all is acceptable, except Fez. Um, but yeah, we look forward to seeing what kind of things you guys come up with, and you will get a contrast key out Answers of in the uh, comment section below, as always. Now, I've been Toby. I've been Rick. And I'm always friend. And if you like the show, don't forget that there is a like button and a subscribe button that you can click very handily placed wherever YouTube has decided to place it today. Uh, we also have a Facebook at... Facebook.com forward slash The Killer Bits. And a Twitter at... The Killer Bits? <laughs> it's at The Killer Bits. It's at The Killer Bits. <laughs> so, thanks for watching. Goodbye.